I was thinking about the places that I personally have adjusted my understanding, in some cases radically, in some mm -hmm. cases it has actually flipped, it's reversed. And it's a never-ending stream. I spent a couple minutes just thinking this morning about places where I had uh, changed what I understood. Okay. And in fact, I realized that one of our first forays into this, I made a substantial error with respect to my understanding of the science, the actual science, which was I believed that because we were dealing with an RNA virus that it transcribed itself oh. into DNA, it reverse transcribed itself and installed itself in the genome, which turns out is not true for coronaviruses. So just to use one of the pieces of jargon that many people will be familiar with, um, you thought, and you said on stream, as I remember it, um, that because it was an RNA virus, it was a retrovirus. Yeah. And not true, not how they work. So, okay, embarrassing error for me right away, but immediately figured it out and corrected it, right? right? Exactly. All right. I don't know how long I could go listing all of the places where I changed my understanding. Many of them, maybe all of them, I think uh, you share, but nonetheless, I realized my position on the functionality of hydroxychloroquine completely inverted. I yeah. believed... Which we and, never talked about on air because it just it just didn't even hit radar, really. This was actually my, yeah. my biggest embarrassment. Yeah. I do not have a good explanation for how I missed the fact that I was being misled by propaganda on this very useful drug until embarrassingly late. But that, anyway... That one was remarkably... That one got us both in a way that most of the, you know, things like two weeks to flatten the curve, like a lot of things that a lot of people right. accepted, like we, ne we never believed, but somehow the... It, it's a it's a Trump delusion and right. it's hydroxychloroquine, and yeah, you know, there was a flood of information and all this. But yeah, I I I bought that. Yep. I bought I bought it for a long time. Yep. Too long. Yeah, and it's not true. All right. Uh, ivermectin effectiveness. Um, now, mind you, effectiveness on two different fronts, both as a treatment for COVID and as a prophylactic. My position on this has changed. It has changed slightly because one paper that uh, appeared to demonstrate extreme effectiveness did not turn out to be what it appeared to be on first pass. I still think the experiment took place. It gave a compelling result. But because the method section uh, did not provide enough information and the data set when I requested it was not forthcoming. This is the one out of Argentina? Yeah. Okay. The, this, the Carvalho study. Yeah. The experiment is not reproducible. Okay. And so I said, you have to take this piece of evidence and give it zero evidentiary weight because it is essential for science to be repeatable. Um, now, I would make that criticism of many experiments on the other side now, too, but... But didn't the Lari uh, meta-analysis remove it and get very much the same results? Or was um, that, not that was the a different they study. Oh, they removed a different um, paper, okay. Yeah, so okay. because it was not a randomized controlled trial, it wasn't in there in the first place. Oh, right. okay. um, it was a different right. study. But yes, and you know, I had tests on because I wanted people to understand that the fact that you've got a study that yeah. turns out to be fraudulent does not invalidate a meta-analysis that included it. In fact, this is one of the strengths of meta-analysis is that you can simply say, what happens if we exclude this study? What does it do to the result? And the answer was it didn't change it very much. But my position on ivermectin effectiveness has largely changed because ivermectin effectiveness has largely changed. Because the virus changed, because the virus is, is mutating as viruses will do, uh, especially with a strong selective force. Well, strong selective force. Now this one perplexed me. You know, At first I thought, is it reduced in effectiveness with respect to the later variants because, um, because resistance has evolved, which I initially said I didn't think was going to happen. Yeah. And, um, Apparently, that is not what's going on. What's yeah. going on is that it is... I feel like is, what little I understand about ivermectin mechanism of action, it wouldn't be resistance. Resistance is unlikely because yeah. there are multiple mechanisms of action. And so the point is, progress against one doesn't substantially alter the fate of the virus in its context. And it's such a broad spectrum anti-parasitic. Right. right. So yeah. what apparently, my understanding, I think largely from Garrett Van, Vandenbosch, is that what happened is the virus adopted a different strategy in which it produced many, many more copies. And so you had to drive the 
effective dose of ivermectin way up, mm. which then creates side effects, which are not terrible side effects, but nonetheless, you don't want to be using this as a prophylactic at a dose that it's causing like visual side effects and things and like that. it's not like you don't become a quadruped and start asking for a saddle. No, that never happened. Oh, okay. um, that was the FDA spreading yeah. misinformation. Incidentally, asterisk for later, I know we're on a roll here, but um, the FDA's lawyers made some interesting claims in court uh, recently about what they did and did not say about ivermectin. Yes, uh, apparently I, we've uh, got them it. telling us that... Uh, it was just a recommendation. Yes, just a recommendation. Yeah. Um, but anyway, okay, so my position on ivermectin effectiveness has changed a little bit because my understanding of the evidence changed, but also because ivermectin effectiveness changed. And the point is a model that is updated with evidence then takes on the clinical change in the effectiveness of this drug and yep. incorporates it. A model that is static, that stuff doesn't work at all, remains static. Um, right. Well, and mm, the virus is evolving, right? Like, so, so even, even a conclusion that is 100% right at time A, at time B, may not be uh, precisely because the object in question that you were talking about, efficacy against or for or whatever, uh, has changed, and therefore, so should the interaction with it. Right. So, the, so should you expect the interaction with it to be So changed. the point is, a dynamic model is inherently better for two different reasons. One, it gets better with respect to a static set of facts, and two, it's the only game in town with respect to a changing set of facts. Right. Uh, and I don't mean changing as in we know the facts to be different, but changing because something is rapidly evolving, for example, and therefore changing the yeah. utility. Yeah. Um, the next one on my list is mask effectiveness. We were famously early, or I was particularly aggressive on the potential utility of masks, and the, especially the mask that I was suggesting people use, which was practical because it wasn't such an impediment to life. Um, turned out to be essentially useless. Um, cloth mask, um, N95 is better, still not effective, but uh, you know may have some impact. Uh, vaccine effectiveness, I was quite convinced by the initial propaganda, it now seems, that came out of the trials that were used to sell the vaccines to us, that the vaccines were likely to be important in the control of the disease. We mm. now know that they do not have even the most basic characteristics that would be necessary for them to be useful in this regard. Mm -hmm. But I was initially taken in by the propaganda. My position has changed. Yep. Vaccine uh, safety. Uh, I was always alarmed that these things couldn't possibly be safe in the way they were saying because safety doesn't mean harmless. Safety means riskless. And there was an obvious long list of potential risks that couldn't be eliminated at the point these things emerged. So and I was still can't be. Still can't be. But the point is, I was actually too cautious. Turns out, you know, I was worried uh, that 20 years down the road, we were going to discover a longevity difference between people who had taken these things or some slow pattern of tumors or autoimmunity would emerge. Wow, did that safety signal show up fast. Um, so anyway, my position has moved in the direction of, wow, these things, not only are they unsafe by virtue of being risky, but they appear to be doing a huge amount of harm. At the same time, they're not very effective at doing the one thing that was of primary interest, which was controlling the spread of the virus. Um, uh, COVID origin, I initially had a chart that, uh, go ahead. Uh, I'm just, I'm reminded with that last one. So, um, so far, you know, I, I think we... So far, basically, we had the same same positioning on on almost all of these things. Um, the thing uh, that was used to dismiss those of us who were concerned about COVID vaccine safety and efficacy early on was that we were inherently the same people who minimized the risks of COVID itself. And uh, actually, so our friend Holly has written a piece called, it's such a brilliant title. The End I'm of forgetting. Faith, the End in, of Sam faith Harris. in Sam Harris. And she actually, she does, she does write by us and discusses, um, you know, his claim that we're those people and says, I, I know they're not. You can just look at Dark Horse and see how seriously they were taking COVID, but also I, Holly, know they're not because... I had COVID twice, and here's how they behave towards me. So uh, the thing 
that I guess I want to add then to your messaging here is um, the ways that people are dismissed gets lumped into like, you know, oh, if you're A, then you're A plus B. It's like, but, I, but I'm not. And the fact that you can't see that it's possible to be A, not B, suggests again that you've been handed a bill of goods, that you've adopted a model that you didn't think through, that you just accepted it, right? That the only way to be, have concern about the safety of the brand new to human experience COVID vaccines was to also be a COVID minimizer uh, is, an absurd position. And the fact is actually that I think another place that I at least um, uh, have, have changed my positioning over time in the almost three years is at first like, oh God, you know, what is this? No, it's not the flu. It's different. It seems to be worse, not clear. No, it's definitely not a cold. But the fact again is that not only do we have more information now, but we also have a change in the disease itself. Now, long COVID is, is real and dangerous. And unfortunately, at this point, it's also true that because both uh, SARS-CoV-2 and the mRNA vaccines are using the spike protein as the thing that, uh, well, SARS-CoV-2 isn't using the spike protein, but that is present in both of them. And it's because that is the source of so much of the cytotoxicity. Uh, it's it's hard in many cases to tell the difference between you know oh do you have long COVID or are you vaccine injured right it can it can it can it is at least potentially hard to tell right it's a, it's a confound it's it's potentially hard to tell but it does seem that if you don't for whatever reason your genetics your lack of comorbidities. Uh, your ability to treat early with all the things that we know you can treat early with, uh, have a mild case of COVID and don't have lingering effects, it doesn't have to be a big deal, except that we still don't know what the long-term effects, very long-term effects might be. Yep. Um, I would say that there's a big lurking question to the extent that people are trying to apply uh, what we're talking about, you know, okay, how am I not going to be on the wrong side of this? How am I going to build an active model that gets better over time, especially if you're not somebody trained in a relevant field? Mm -hmm. Well, part of the trick is figuring out how to proxy trust and revoke it if somebody mm. doesn't do this job very well. Yeah. But I would say one question that remains very active in my mind is what are the chances that if we hadn't deployed the vaccines, we'd be done? That this would legitimately have burned itself out. And while that will sound fanciful, can you be here saying it would not have become endemic? I am saying that because, let me point something out, Wuhan 1, it's gone. It's extinct. And so the question is, did herd immunity drive Wuhan 1 to extinction? So I've never heard that term before. I can extrapolate what you mean. Wuhan 1, you're, you're basically the... <laughs> <laughs> it's not wild type, but no. like, you know, if, if SARS-CoV-2 hadn't been frank-engineered in a, in a lab, it would be the wild type, the original virus that, yeah. uh, that we were all dealing with in spring 2020. Right. So that thing is, yeah. and, you know, I will say that there is a complex set of questions around viral swarms, which I think yeah. are not well dealt with and mm -hmm. need to be understood. But one very live possibility, according to my model, and who knows? Next week, I may understand why my model is wrong, and therefore this line of inquiry doesn't make sense. But one very live possibility is that if we had done nothing that drove the evolution of these uh, these viruses, that we would be done by virtue of herd immunity, which would have been painfully acquired with many, many deaths, but nonetheless, we'd be finished. And that the very... Finished with the virus, not finished as humanity. Right. Finished with the virus. Mm -hmm. COVID would have burned itself out, right? Um, we'll never know. I don't know that we'll never know. I think we will never know for sure. I think the point is this is a tractable question. This is a studyable question. And what we have done by deploying a cartoonishly narrow vaccine is we have amplified the evolutionary signal. We have asked the we have asked evolution to play a game that it is master of mm -hmm. right not only can you adapt but can you adapt to something stupidly narrow of course you can right easily and yeah. again and again so yeah. um 
So in any case, this is a place where, yep. and I'm going to argue that the, the right way to think about these complex problems is to get over your instinct to leap to a conclusion, to leap to a conclusion of any kind, really. Mm -hmm. right? The point is, you should maintain these things probabilistically. And yeah, the, tough for people. Right. So tough for people. But because people want certainty. This I know. Well, so that that is true. It is true. That's what people want. But you know, I used to I used to play this game with our kids where if they said something <laughs> with <know>. certainty, <laughs> I used to say, "What do you think the probability is that that's not true?" And of or course, or how certain are you? For very young children, the answer 100%. is 100%. Of course. And the answer is, right. no, you just screwed up. You just told me something wrong. Yeah. You're, the probability should not be zero. It might be a tiny yeah. fraction of 1%, yeah. right? The tiny fraction. But, and you know, I mean, let's... Um, very young children, you expect that answer. And, you know, of course. But, but the point is, you got to break that habit. Right. you got to break that habit. And what we have... And you did that. ...is an, an adult expert class that we are now detecting never got that lesson. Right. They and so what this does is it creates a yeah. very bad mechanism for thinking that is cryptic in any place where your intellectual ancestors have done a decent job. Right. So the point is, if you walk into physics, right, mm -hmm. and you adopt the standard model, the standard model is pretty good. It's pretty predictive, and you can become expert at it. But you're not going to extend it if what you're doing is taking on that model and using it as a set of assumptions, which is fair, but. If that's all you do, then the point is you can't detect where this thing doesn't work. Right. Right. You're just going to keep applying it, and you're going to you're going to rationalize it.